Okay. All right. So uh, for the next part, what I would like you to is to do the following: uh, open your browser, and I'm pasting a link uh, to the chat, and open that link in your browser. The first link. Can you click on that? And you can follow along with me. Can you still see my screen though? Yes, I uh, can see your browser. Okay. So uh, when you paste this link, you will see on browser that uh, it says sign in. And the first option is email one time password. And that's what we are going to use. So click on email one time password and provide your email. Uh, you don't need to provide any of your work email. You can It can be any email you like. And then send passcode. Is everyone with me so far? Are you able to uh, get to this point? So if you are good to on this step, you can uh, tap plus one in the chat so we know you are good to go. Yeah, uh, any feedback would be very helpful if you're yep, able or, to- Or giving a thumbs okay. up plus one or a thumbs up, then we'll know you're, you're on board with us. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, you're, getting, you're getting positive. I got my code just now and I click on sign in. Once you click sign in, you will see a review and join uh, Quantum Bootcamp Australia. As you can see, it's available for 72 hours, start time today. And now you will need to do agree. I agree with the terms and conditions and then click on join event. And when you see that this is the event ends in two days, 22 hours, 40 minutes. It's asking for event access code. Okay, let me provide you the, uh, if you had just, just one, uh, if you had clicked on the link, there wouldn't, there wouldn't be any problem, but uh, I've just sent the access code. You can use that access code to get access to workshop environment up here. Okay. So uh, for people who needed access code, uh, are you able to, Nelson, for instance, are you able to use this access code to get in? Okay, perfect. So now somebody is typing very fast. <laughs> anyway, so we have, uh, uh, so on this uh, uh, workshop studio page, uh, you have access to your workshop studio, if you click on here, it will just show you how to sign in, everything. Access to Amazon Bracket Console. That's where we are right now. I'll take you further. And then if you click on Amazon Bracket General Immersion Day module, you have all these different types of notebooks, right? Uh, running quantum circuit, quantum noise simulation, bracket, hybrid algorithms, and so on and so forth. So you can you could download these notebooks, you know, for your uh, later. Uh, experimentation and so on and so forth. Okay, and if you click next, uh, it will it will go to a take you to a different module. Okay, so at this point, I would like you to uh, take a look at uh, click on this link, open AWS console, and it will take you to this AWS console where you will have this. Uh, is everyone with me so far? Okay, perfect. So we have this AWS console up, uh, home up here. Now, how do we get to Amazon Bracket, right? So if you click on services and go to quantum technologies, you will find Amazon Bracket here. You could click here or in the search bar, search bar just search Bracket and voila. Click it there and you'll get to Amazon Bracket. And now we are on Amazon Bracket um, uh, dashboard. 
it might feel like a rabbit hole, but uh, believe me, it's not. It's now we are nearly there. So, uh, everyone with me so far uh, uh, to Amazon Bracket dashboard? Okay, good. So now on the dashboard, you will see, can you show where the console is? Uh, if you look at this workshop studio on the left-hand side, on the menu, there is like AWS account access on the bottom. On the third section, AWS, uh, AWS account access, open AWS console. You can click on there. Is that uh, okay? Good, thank you. So you go to console and in the search bar, search for Amazon Bracket and click on click there. You will get here. This is Amazon Bracket uh, uh, service dashboard. Okay, so on the dashboard here, there are several announcements. So recent announcement about various services, uh, changes in the services and so on, so forth announced here. Uh, then community support, you can take a look at Stack Exchange uh, and quantum computing blog or repost. And there are several resources about learning, learning plan. So if you click on Amazon Bracket learning plan, uh, there is this called, this is called Amazon Bracket badge. You can enroll. Uh, in there, and uh, basically, you could spend like in total two hours and a half and take the exam. Like uh, you can go through a short course, uh, take the test, and if you score more than eighty percent, uh, you would be awarded a digital badge that you can display on your LinkedIn profile and so on and so forth that you have completed and you are uh, you know uh, you know about Amazon Bracket and basics of Amazon Bracket. Okay. Yeah, to add on here, um, particular to this bootcamp, um, for anyone who are able to pass the uh, bracket badge uh, assessment, that's a free one in the next two two weeks after the bootcamp close, we will give out the fifty dollar cloud credit for you. Uh, so you can contact me uh, if once you pass that, I'll post my email address in the chat. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Albert. Yeah. Okay, so now we, uh, if you click on devices, you will see that there are several devices uh, that, are, that are being shown up here. Uh, first, you will see that Amazon Web Services hardware provider are uh, three simulators: State Vector One, Tensor Network, and Density Matrix. So these are simulators; these are not quantum hardware that is available through uh, by Amazon uh, Web Services. If you click on SP One. Uh, so it says online, available now, task queue depth zero, means there are like, there's practically no waiting, right? Uh, and then like, if you look at the cost, so the way uh, running on simulator is charged by, is by per minute. So the, depending on how long your code runs, um, you know, uh, so it, you, it is charged 7.5 cents per minute. Okay, for state vector one. For tensor network one, the charges are a little bit higher. It's 27 cents per minute. Then we have uh, several devices from IonQ. So IonQ, the like Harmony, uh, that's an 11 qubit device. It's currently offline uh, because it's undergoing maintenance. Uh, then ARIA one, that's a 25 qubit uh, device uh, that has like error mitigation support. ARIA 2 is similar to ARIA 1, and ARIA 1 and uh, 1 2 are like backup devices for each other. And then ION Q Forte, uh, Forte, is, uh, Forte 1 is a reservation only. Like if you want to reserve the device for an hour or so to run uh, a specified program, you could do that through what is called Amazon uh, like Bracket Direct service. And to, lo to learn more about Bracket Direct, you could you know click on Bracket Direct on, um, on the left menu up here, uh, and you could do that. But in today's, uh, this access to bracket that is available for 72 hours, uh, you would not be able to take advantage of uh, bracket direct. You can access to uh, simulators uh, and Lucy device, I suppose, but not INQ ARIA. Okay. 
because there are some restriction to it. Then there is Cuera device, Akela. Uh, that is a 256 device currently available right now. Uh, but uh, Akela is a is a analog Hamiltonian simulation device that doesn't run uh, qubit uh, circuits, like, like uh, gate-based circuits. So that's that. And Rigetti is currently offline for um, unscheduled like, maintenance and so on. Okay. So now, if you click on notebooks, uh, that takes you to this page, and you should see a live URL appear. Okay. So click on this live URL, and that will open for you a Jupyter Lab. Um, hi, can I interrupt? Sorry for interrupting. I just have a uh, quick sure. question. So there are like multiple devices that we can use for um, our different uh, algorithms or circuits that we want to run. So is there any guide from Amazon that can show like what kind of noise that we should expect or what are the thresholds in different devices that we can experience if we run some circuit? Like let's say if my circuit is very small and uh, and like small circuit devices are like small devices are not available, but the big ones are available. So normally as the size of the device is bigger, the noise is also bigger. So is there any guide or any uh, any toolbox from Amazon that shows like what is the noise parameters in different devices and we can decide based on that what device we should be using for running our circuits? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, so we don't have like a, uh, access to noise model per se, uh, but you could look at like, different noise models available from uh, hardware providers. However, if you look at, for example, ARIA-1 device, right, and click on calibration. So calibration shows a lot of data here. For example, average one qubit fidelity is this, two qubit fidelity is 97%, uh, and data fidelity and T1 and T2 and all these calibration information is there. So you may be able to use this uh, to determine uh, like uh, what kind of, like, uh, uh, you know, fidelity you, you, you'll be expecting at the end. So that is uh, the all information uh, available for INQ, for instance. For uh, uh, Oxford quantum circuits, if you click on calibration, like they have like some calibration data available and the topology. And at the same time for Rigetti, uh, if you click on calibration, that's the topology of device and you have more uh, cubic specs available for each qubit. What is the readout and active research facility and so on. Uh, all so, right, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah I think that, that answered my question, so thank you. Okay, good, great. Okay, so uh, is everyone able to click on this live link and get to this Jupyter lab up here? Okay, great. Uh, so there's a question about T1 and T2. So T1 and T2 basically are like, uh, 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 if you will, like for, for instance, if I show you the calibration. Uh, so if you click on info, for instance, right, you will see that T1 is known as energy relaxation. It is a time scale for a state one to decay towards uh, ground state zero. Right, so if you, uh, okay. And similarly, T2 is the, uh, this is the defacing time. That is the time scale for a plus state to decode into completely big state. So that's uh, the meaning of T1 and T2. Okay, uh, so, all right, so we are, can you show how to access bracket from console? So from console, you could just, uh, if you go to AWS console up here, just in the bracket search bar, just search bracket and click, you will, oh, there's an answer. Uh, Albert already answered that. Okay. So, so I hope you're able to get to this Jupyter lab, right? And there are three folders. Do you, does everyone see these three folders when you go to Jupyter Lab? Okay. Anyone who doesn't, or anyone who is having trouble uh, getting to this point of uh, accessing Jupyter Lab. 
So if anyone has, still has issue, feel free to unmute yourself and uh, ask how we can help you. Because all the subsequent hands-on sessions will be based on this platform. And actually this is a real AWS environment. Uh, it's not a simulated environment. It's a real environment. That means in the future, if you have AWS account, when you start to use this, that's exactly the same view and the same process to use that. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, that's a good point, Albert. Thanks for pointing that out. So yeah, as Albert mentioned, this is not like a, a simulation of AWS environment, but this is actually how it works. Like when you, after 72 hours, when you have access to AWS account and use Amazon Bracket, this is exactly how it's going to look. Yeah. Uh, so Albert, I'm not sure, like uh, is there a, a break time uh, at some point or uh, can I continue? Um. I think we can continue. It just one hour. Okay. Maybe we run for another half hour. We can stop for five minutes. Okay. So uh, let me go back to the presentation, and after completing the presentation, we will take five minutes break and then uh, resume with the hands-on lab. How to access notebook? Very good question. So on on Amazon Bracket on the left hand menu, uh, you will have you'll see dashboard devices and notebook. Click on notebooks. And when you click notebooks, you'll see this live link here URL. Click on this URL, you'll get to Jupyter Lab. And how to run those uh, uh, notebooks, I will tell you in a minute. Well, more than a minute, more like half an hour. But if you're interested, like, uh, uh, let, let me just answer that question. So we have these three folders up here. Uh, and click on bracket workshops. You'll see that two folders reinvent SC that is not relevant for now, like uh, immersion days. Click on immersion days, and there are different notebooks available for different things, right? So, if you click on quantum tasks, this is the getting started uh, notebook that we will be running, like after going through the presentation. Okay, so let me not jump ahead and go back to, pre to the presentation. Okay, are there any questions before we go back and talk about uh, quantum gates and quantum circuits? Nope, it doesn't appear to be. Okay, all right, perfect, thank you. So uh, let's move ahead and uh, I'll talk about building a quantum circuit. And I'm sure like some of you have already uh, heard about and know uh, quite in detail what a quantum circuit means and how to build it. However, like uh, I, I think like uh, it is uh, beneficial to to touch base uh, to the very basics of uh, you know of fundamental gates and and review what uh, like quantum gate means and uh, how to build a quantum circuit, right? So quantum circuit building blocks like that are in some sense is very similar to what we have uh, in traditional computing, right? So in a Boolean circuit. We have uh, some inputs, like uh, input qubits, A, B, C. We apply some number of gates. And at the end, we measure the output right, uh, of the logic. So that's Boolean circuit. Like, depending on uh, what gates you apply, the state of output Q could be 0 or 1. Or right, fair. Quantum circuit are quite similar in the sense that you also start with some uh, a register of uh, you know quantum uh, bits, qubits. Uh, initially uh, initialized in state zero, then you apply, you know, quantum gates, Hadamard gates, right? And at the end, you measure what the output is going to be. So rationale is, you start with input re register, apply quantum like quantum gates, and you measure uh, output at the end. However, there is a like a very uh, stark difference up here. The first difference you notice that on quantum circuit you have as many inputs as outputs, okay? That is not necessarily true in Boolean circuits, right? In Boolean circuit, you have like just one, out, one output. Furthermore, quantum circuits are reversible. Okay? And by reversible mean that if you, if I give you a state, output state of a quantum circuit and run it backwards, like the circuit backwards, I will get to the initial state, no doubt. Like that's, that's a basic uh, like a uh, feature of a quantum circuit. It's reversible because all these operations are, uh, uh, you know, 
are uh, represented by uh, unitary matrices, which are reversible. But that is not true in, in traditional uh, circuits, right? I mean, given just one input zero or one, one output zero or one, there is no way I can trace back to what the initial uh, state of ABC was, right? So uh, the idea is that in some sense, like uh, in the rationale, quantum circuit is similar to classical circuits in the sense that you start with uh, you know, a register of qubits, you apply some quantum gates, and then at the end, you measure the output. However, there are like small, strong differences. The difference is being quantum circuit is reversible. They have as many outputs as inputs. And then they work with quantum gates. Again, quantum gates are also very different in, uh, in their nature as compared to classical gates, as you will learn in the next slides. Okay. So building a quantum circuit, first, as you might have noticed, we need qubits. Right, uh, input and out, like input register of qubits. Then we need quantum gates, right? So like uh, qubits and quantum gates is what uh, is what we need to build a quantum circuit. What is a qubit? So qubit uh, is a, a fundamental unit of uh, uh, you know information in quantum computing. So a qubit it can be represented by a state psi, which can be either zero or one or somewhere a mixture of zero and one. A mixture in the sense that alpha, uh, alpha zero plus beta one, in such that uh, mod alpha square plus mod square beta square is one. Okay. So a single qubit represented like this can be, you know, thought of uh, in the following way on this block sphere, where the north pole of a sphere represents state zero, and the south pole represents state one. So if it was a classical bit, right, the state of the uh, classical bit would either be zero or one at a given time. However, in quantum bits or qubit, the state of a qubit can, can be anywhere on this two sphere or, this, or the surface of the sphere. That is to say, the state of a qubit is represented by a unit vector in this uh, unit sphere, parameterized by two parameters, theta and pi. So I can write the state of a qubit as cosine theta divided by two times zero plus e to the i pi sine theta by two, one, okay? So far, uh, uh, is it clear? Are, are there any questions in understanding what the, state of a qubit in terms of block sphere is. Okay, I'll take that as a, no, I mean, I, I, I will assume that everybody understands that. So, so, so the statement here is that state of a, of a single qubit is given by a unit vector on block sphere, right? This two sphere. Now, what, the, what a quantum gate does to a qubit is that all it does, a quantum gate to a single qubit, is that it rotates this qubit on this block sphere, right? For example, if I apply a not gate on, on, on qubit zero, qubit which is pointing towards zero, all it does is that it rotates 180 degree, uh, it rotates the qubit with respect to x-axis 180 degrees. Similarly, if I apply not gate to this uh, uh, unit vector up here, all it does, it, it will rotate psi all the 180 degrees with respect to x-axis. That's all it does. Then we have uh, single qubit uh, gates as rotation with respect to y-axis, with rotation with respect to z-axis, and so on and so forth. So quantum gate, a single qubit quantum gate, what it does is just rotates uh, this unit vector in any other direction. And then it can be represented by two parameters, theta and pi. So now we know what a qubit is and we know what a quantum gate is. So let's talk about quantum gates, uh, or like, uh, how to use this quantum gate to build a quantum circuit. So the building would be initialize, uh, uh, initial register of qubits, that is prepare the initial state. So let's say you have n number of qubits, or like for example, two qubits, you just initialize them in zero state, then, Execute unitary gates, 
like you apply some unitary gates on this uh, uh, circuit up here, like we'll know, we'll discuss the meaning of H and this, uh, this gate up here in, in a minute. And then at the end, you make measurement at the output to see what the measurement is going to be. Another important difference between the me between measuring classical bit and quantum bit is that in classical case, uh, the answer is deterministic, right? The state of a qubit, like output Q, uh, as we saw in the quantum circuit, uh, in a classical circuit, is deterministic. It's a uh, for a fixed input, the output is always fixed. However, in quantum circuit, the situation is different. For a given input, there are multiple possible outcomes uh, at the output. And that is because of the superposition principle. The state of a quantum uh, uh, quantum computer or quantum system has contributions from several different uh, 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 fundamental states, right? So uh, measuring a qubit for a, for a fixed input even can give different outcomes. But what do, they, do these different outcomes mean? So these different outcomes basically mean, basically represent the probability with which uh, the you can get this, uh, you know, uh, output. So, uh, so the measurement, measuring a quantum circuit is similarly, uh, similar to doing a sampling, right? And this sampling uh, that you are doing is from a quantum state that determines the, the probability distribution function of that uh, of, uh, of that sample, right? So, uh, yeah, that's that's how uh, like uh, the measurement in uh, quantum circuits work. And we'll we'll look at it in more detail uh, in the next few slides. Let's talk about quantum gates. So, the very basic gate is called not gate. So, not gate is like if you have a qubit a, all this not gate does is it uh, takes, um, it applied a complement uh, to A, right? A goes to A bar, right? So for instance, example, if A is in state zero, A bar is in one, and if it's in one, X uh, takes one to zero. And this is very similar to the not gate in classical set, right? Classical not gate, if you apply not gate to zero, it goes to one, apply not gate to one, it goes to zero. So. I mean, no surprises here. This is this is all good. Now there is a gate called Hadamard gate in in quantum uh, quantum world, as it represented by H. Here, if you apply Hadamard gate to state zero, then output of that state or that qubit it becomes zero plus one divided by square root two. Okay. So zero goes to zero plus one divided by square root two. And now what does this mean? It means that in, if input is zero, at the output when, you, when I measure, I can get either zero or one. Is that, uh, does that make sense? Or, or are there any questions about it? Do you like, uh, Okay, so I, I I assume there are no questions. So Hadamard gate state take the state zero to uh, state zero plus one divided by two, square root two. So this this is called superposition. So zero plus one divided by square root two is an equal superposition state of zero and one. And by equal superposition means that that at the output when you measure, let's say you measure. Uh, 100 times, then approximately 50 number of times you will measure output to be zero, and the other 50 times you will measure uh, the output to be uh, in state one. And that is what I meant by uh, like a probabilistic or sampling. Right? In a single measurement, you don't know what you're going to get, whether you're going to get zero or one. It's only over a, uh, over a, a certain number of measurements that you would, you can say that approximately 50 number of times, 50% of the time you get zero, another 50% time you'll get state one. Similarly, if you start with state one, the Hadamard 
application to a state one, it go to zero minus one divided by square root two. Okay. Now, uh, let me ask you a question. What do you think the measurement is going to look like in the state, uh, in the second case here? That is, if you start with one and you get the state zero minus one divided by square root two. How do you think the measurement is going to be different as compared to the first scenario? Now, feel free to unmute yourself and answer your question. Is there going to be any difference? And if there is, how? Um, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Just to attempt, I think it will be a difference in phase. So uh, just in terms of the sign, I think I guess borrowing from typical waves, that's just what I'm thinking. Right. I mean, you, you answered correctly that uh, the difference is going to be in, in terms of phase. But when you measure the outcome, right, uh, the outcome, like outcome is a classical uh, classical measurement. Like uh, at, the, at the end, you either get zero or one. But so in terms of outcomes, you either get zero or one. 50% of the time you'll get zero and 50% of the time you'll get one. So just measuring this circuit in the computational basis, you will see no difference between zero and one. However, the state is different. And this is explained by the fact that the probability of outcome is given by the square of the amplitude, right? Uh, the absolute value of the uh, square of the absolute value of the amplitudes. So here, although the amplitude is minus one over square root two, but the probability of measuring in state one is become square of one over square root two, that is half, right? So although there is a, a difference in terms of phase, uh, only just doing measurement, you will not see any difference, okay? To measure the phase, there is like uh, different algorithms uh, that you can use to uh, determine phase. Okay, so now important point is that this Hadamard gate generates a single qubit superposition, right? And it has no classical analog, right? You cannot represent, uh, reproduce this circuit uh, or like this outcome by any classical means, any any combination of classical gates. So this is a true quantum gate that has no classical analog. Okay, and this represents one of the base, uh, fundamental principles of quantum mechanics or quantum computing, and that is superposition. All right. Okay, now let's graduate to two qubit gates. Uh, so one of the fundamental two qubit gates that is used everywhere in quantum circuitry is called C naught gate, that is controlled naught gate. We saw what a NOT gate means. So NOT gate simply means that uh, the uh, the the output of output is flipped, right? If it's zero, it goes to one, or one goes to zero. Simple. Control NOT gate, on the other hand, this flipping of a state of a qubit depends on a different qubit that is called control qubit. Let me explain. You have two qubits, A and B. The idea is that the state of qubit B changes or flips depending on the state of qubit A. Okay. And this is represented by this truth table up here. If state of A is zero, then nothing happens to B. B goes to just as it is, right? And like that, this operation B or A just goes like that. So if A is zero and B is zero, we have zero, zero. If A is zero, B is one, you get to a zero, one. Life is simple. However, if the state of A is one, that is, uh, if it's one, then B is flipped. B goes from zero to one and one to zero. So state one, zero goes to one, one, and one, one goes to one, zero, okay? And this generates a, a two qubit entanglement, right? Because the output of uh, you know state uh, you know qubit B has information about uh, the qubit uh, the state of qubit A, right? So this generates uh, you know entanglement between two qubits, and this also has no classical analog. That is to say that you cannot reproduce this uh, uh, truth table by any number of combination of classical gates like such as ZOR or NOR and NAND or or whatnot. Okay, so this is a true quantum gate. 
Okay, so we so we uh, discussed three quantum gates up here. First was NOT gate, which has which had a very clear classical analog, it was a simple NOT gate, but had a mod gate, which was uh, a superposition gate, and uh, this control NOT gate, uh, C NOT gate, did not does not have or they do not have any uh, classical analog. Like no uh, combination of classical uh, gates can reproduce this. Uh, to table for Hadamard and C not gate. Are there any questions before I go ahead? Not in the chat, thanks. Okay. And uh, on like, if, are there any live questions that participants want to ask? I mean, I understand that this stuff might be too basic for some, but I think like uh, uh, people who are experiencing quantum computing for the first time, this might take a little bit sinking in. So feel free to ask any questions. I, I just want to confirm for the C not mm -hmm. gate, it only takes effect when, for example, A is one. If A is not zero, then it does not have an effect. Yeah, if A is zero, then it does not have any effect on the uh, on the output of right. B. Okay, thank you. Okay, all right. So moving on. So let's uh, uh, um, let's go. Sorry, British. Yeah. Question came uh, from chat. Um, can yeah. you explain the reversibility in this circuit? Uh, reversibility in this circuit. Okay. Yes. So right. So just as one zero goes to one one, right, and one one goes to one zero. So you can reverse this, like. Right? If you treat this as a, uh, as an input, this output as an out input, like one one will go to one zero, and one zero will go to one one, which is what we were, we saw. But when input was one zero, output was one one, and when output is one zero, input is one one. So it's a reversible circuit. I mean, yeah, you can, yeah. I mean, I can, uh, I can turn this around. I can just write output here and input here, and this uh, this truth table will still be true. Yeah, there's another question. Uh, what will happen if the input is not pure zero or one, but a hybrid state? Very good question. So if the input of A is a hybrid state, then the input of uh, B would also be a hybrid state. It will be a mixture of zero and one. And that I can give you as an exercise uh, to convince yourself how that works. So no question clearly in the queue. Okay, no questions? Okay, perfect. All right, so now let's uh, use this uh, two basic gates we learned about, Hadamard and C0, to build something interesting, a bell circuit, right? So this bell circuit, very basic, two qubits starting in 0, 0. We put a Hadamard gate and C0 gate, and let's see what the outcome is going to look like, right? Generally, if there are two qubits, what are the possibilities? Possibilities are that you could either measure 0, measure zero, zero 1, 1, 0, 1, or 1, 0. There are four possibilities that you can measure at the output if you have a two qubit circuit. The speciality of this circuit is that it restricts the output to only 0, 0, or 1, 1 in such a way that both alpha and beta are 1 over square root 2. Okay, so this is similar to what a Hadamard gate was doing. You remember Hadamard gate, when you started with state zero, it took you to zero plus one divided by square root two. And here, what you're doing is you're starting with zero, zero, the output is going to be zero, zero plus one, one divided by square root two. So in essence, what this bell circuit is doing is, is generating you an equal, probability, uh, you know, uh, output state of state 0, 0, 0, and 1, 1, okay? So at the, when, at the output, when you measure, each measurement will either yield 0, 0, or 1, 1 with equal probability. 
in an ideal scenario, you will not uh, measure any one zero or zero one state. Is this clear so far? Are there any questions? Okay, so if there are no questions, I would like to also tell you that this is uh, also what is called maximally entangled state uh, for two qubit, right? So uh, usually you might have heard about uh, like uh, uh, in quantum communication, you prepare two qubits in entangled state in a fully entangled state and you send one qubit uh, to another location there, which is still being entangled and if uh, like, for example, Alice has qubit A and Bob has qubit B, and Bob makes a, makes a measurement, measurement on uh, on the state uh, of qubit B, then Bob comes to know exactly what the state of, uh, you know, qubit A that Alice has. And that is because, you know, uh, if, uh, the, if Bob measures zero, then it is definite that, uh, that Alice has the qubit in state zero, and if Bob measures one, one uh, Alice will have the state uh, of qubit one. So that is a property of, uh, you know, uh, a quantum entanglement. However, if like the state was not zero, zero plus one, one, but there was another contribution, then, uh, you know, uh, the state will not be fully uh, entangled. There will be some contribution to, uh, you know, uh, non-entanglement as well. Okay. So this uh, is the Bell circuit and in the exercise that follows, we are going to build this bell circuit. We will uh, simulate this using simulators and we will convince ourselves uh, whether uh, all these properties of like measurement, uh, how measuring 50% of the time and so on and so forth, are they true, how they work and how we can simulate this using uh, Amazon Bracket. Okay, so now uh, it's time for hands-on lab. So, but before moving to hands-on lab, uh, are there any questions uh, that I can answer? There's a question in the chat. Um, that might this might be trivial, but are the zero and the zero zero same or different states? Yeah, I mean they are different states. Like the, the state zero has only one qubit in state zero, and zero zero represents two qubit state two qubit state where both qubits are in zero state. Why is square root two common across many of these equations? That's a very good question. So square root two basically uh, comes in for normalization, right? So uh, uh, the, the statement is, like if you look at uh, this uh, slide up here, the statement is that alpha, mod alpha square plus mod beta square should be equal to one. And if there was another term gamma, then plus mod gamma square will have to be one as well. So this is for normalization. And if you look at alpha and beta, only two coefficients, uh, mod alpha square plus mod beta square, beta square is equal to one. And if I say that alpha is equal to beta, that uh, uh, probability is half half, then Naturally, you would say that, okay, alpha has to be one over square root two or minus one over square root two for that matter. Uh, this is confusing for people who don't have quantum background knowledge before the workshop. Yes, this is confusing. And that's why I, I would, uh, so if, if the, uh, like, uh, um, I try to explain that uh, alpha and beta are like coefficients. Uh, they are normalized. And for normalization, they have to follow this condition, mod alpha square plus mod beta square is equal to one. You mentioned that we do sampling for a quantum organ's output. What causes the variation between different samples? Is it purely due to qubit errors, et cetera? Okay, very good question. So it's not due to qubit errors. Even if we had like perfect qubits with zero errors, it is a basic fundamental property of quantum mechanics that the outputs are probabilistic, right? Just by looking at this equation, like alpha zero zero plus beta one one. If I ask you, 
if you me make measurement of these two qubits just once, what are you going to get? Just think about it. What are you going to get? Will you get 0, 0 or will you get 1, 1? And the answer is that like we don't know until we make a measurement either state. Yeah, you could get either 0 or 1, 1. Okay. Until you make the measurement, you don't know whether it's going to, going to get 0 or 1, 1. But all you know is that I can get 0, 0 with 50% of the probability, uh, with 50% chance. And if you recall your probability theory, or like a, like a basic uh, probability, that if you are working with the probabilistic events, you cannot predict the outcome exactly. All you can do is like, try the, that outcome, like 100 number of times, and you will see whether your probability comes out to be true or not, right? For example, if uh, in, a, uh, in, a, in a very simple example, in a bank, there are two red and two, um, uh, or, or even, even very simple. If in a bag, there is a one, uh, one uh, red uh, ball and a, a black ball, right? And the bag is closed. And if I ask you, if I take out one ball, what the outcome is going to be? You don't know. I mean, it could be red or black. And that is what quantum mechanics is saying here. There is no nothing error here. It's it's all perfect, even if in the perfect world. It's just uh, that the state of a quantum uh, uh, like quantum register or, or or a quantum circuit is such that it is a mixture of uh, you know or uh, not mixture. It's the superposition of different outcomes, and you could get any of those outcomes depending on the probability. Did I answer your question, Victor? I mean, there are many more gates in quantum computing. These are just very basic gates I showed you uh, in order to uh, you know show how you can really do to give a quantum circuit. But you you there are many gates: rotation, uh, rotation gates, and then there's like uh, control gates, control Z, control rotations, and so on. So. There are many more gates. What is the difference between zero and ket zero? So if you, usually when you write just zero, you mean uh, a zero, just zero is a classical number, right? It, it's a number that you can, it can also be, it can be either a state of a classical bit or a outcome of a measurement. And when you write uh, zero within this, uh, this notation called, Ket notation, uh, notation that represents that means that the it's a quantum state of a qubit, right? And the qubit is in state zero. That's all it means. So it's a quantum way of representing the state of a single qubit. While if you don't write that ket, that zero could mean anything. Like it could be uh, the uh, outcome of measurement or um, you know, just uh, it can represent the classical number or something like that. Yeah. When the entanglement happens between zero, two, and the output of Hadamard gate at the same, what would be the output? I didn't quite get the question here. SK, uh, if you could unmute yourself and answer, uh, ask that question. Uh, well, what I was asking uh, was, uh, so you have uh, state one, right? That passes through Hadamard gate. Mm -hmm. And um, and then the output of that would be, uh, like there's a 50% chance of it being up and 50% chance of it being down. Mm -hmm. And then there is an entanglement uh, where, is, where you pass yeah. through C0 gate. And the uh, like what happens with the state two uh, depends on, the output of the Hadamard gate. If the output of the Hadamard gate is one, then the state two uh, gives a particular output. And then if it is zero, you get a different output. So right. my question is because you, the the final state of the Hadamard gate, because it's uh, a superposed state and it is not like a definite zero or one, mm -hmm. um, how does the C0, how is the C0 gate applied 
on on the output of the Hadamard gate when the output is not definite, zero or one. Did I explain it well? When the output is not even... Yeah, so, okay, so let, let me let me just try to explain here. So if you start with state zero, zero up here, if the state is, uh, Hadamard state is zero, right? Uh, zero will, um, you know, zero can, uh, so Hadamard can, will give output either zero plus one, right? So if you consider the state zero, the zero will have no effect on two, and you will state you will measure zero zero at the output. Okay, but if you consider the second possibility, that is one, then because of one, the state of qubit two will be flipped from zero to one, and you will measure one one at the output. So that way, uh, at the output, you are either measuring zero zero or measuring one one. Is that clear? Uh, yeah, that's clear. Okay, good.